Hi, and welcome back to our matter unit here in AP Biology. And at this point, we're going to transition into a discussion of the, the organic molecules that are used in living systems and the roles that they play. And we're going to start with a discussion of carbohydrates and lipids. But this is not a picture of either a carbohydrate or a lipid. This is a picture of a relatively simple organic molecule called urea. And it's actually an interesting molecule in the history of investigations into life's chemistry. You make urea every day of your life. It is the main non-water-based ingredient of this substance. This is, of course, urine. So urea is actually a waste molecule in biological systems, but it's also kind of an interesting molecule because it is the first organic molecule that was ever synthesized independently of a biological system. In the 19th century, Friedrich Wohler synthesized urea from inorganic starting materials, and as a result, you can buy all the urea you want, and you don't have to collect it from the urine of mammals. But this is actually a really important point in the history of chemistry, because until Wohler did this, it was thought by many people that biological molecules were somehow special, that they couldn't be created outside of biological systems. That thinking was referred to as vitalism, and it turns out that it's totally incorrect. Biological molecules are made out of some of the most common elements on the periodic table, and there's really nothing all that special about them from the perspective of what they're made out of. The question that we're gonna to try to answer over these next two videos is what are living things made of? And in this video, we're gonna spotlight carbohydrates and lipids. And I've got this picture of a piece of bread and butter because that's a good example of these two groups of biological molecules. The carbohydrates would be found in the bread, they're in the grain that makes up the bread, and the lipids would be found in the butter. So let's take a look at each one in turn. We're going to start with carbohydrates, which you may also know as sugars or sometimes starch or fiber. Carbohydrates are a biological molecule that are made out of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and they're typically represented in this ring fashion. That's an example of the monomer of a biological molecule. Most of the biological macromolecules exist both as monomers and as polymers, the polymer being a structure built out of combinations of many, many, many of the monomers. This particular monomer of a carbohydrate, a monosaccharide, if you will, is glucose, which is a very, very common six carbon monosaccharide sugar. Because carbohydrates can exist in combinations, we can start sticking them together. Here we've got one example disaccharide that we get from putting two monosaccharides together. In this case, we're putting together a glucose and a fructose molecule, and we're making sucrose as a result. Sucrose is also known as table sugar. It's what you use to put sugar into your food, for instance. I've also put a molecule of water here just as a reminder that anytime we join biological molecules together in a dehydration synthesis reaction, water is produced. Of course, we don't have to stop there. We can put many, many hundreds of thousands of sugar monomers together, and then we start to get the polymers, which are the polysaccharides. This is an example of one of them. This is cellulose, which is the main ingredient in plant cell walls. This is another one. This is glycogen, which is the polysaccharide that animal systems use for energy storage, and it's how excess sugar in your body is stored in your liver cells, for example. Let's go ahead and enlarge this, and you can see each of the individual glucose monomers stuck together to make this glycogen polymer. Many, many thousands of these units would be joined together. In terms of talking about the functions of carbohydrates, they're really our go-to source for quick energy production. For instance, they're the starting material for cellular respiration. And monosaccharides and disaccharides are really what biological systems prefer to use for ATP production. Of course, if you have more sugar in you than you need at any time, you can store it. And so amylose, which is the plant version, also called starch or glycogen, which we just saw, which is what we use in animal systems. This is for slightly longer term energy storage. But carbohydrates also have another function in systems not like our body as a structural support in the cell walls that surround many other types of cells, just not our type of cells. What I've done here is I've blown up subsections of cellulose and glycogen so you can see the difference between them. Notice that there actually is no difference between the actual monomers. The difference is in the connections between the individual monomers, what are called the glycosidic bonds. You can see that the energy storage polysaccharides, amylose and glycogen, are connected by one type of glycosidic bond, whereas the cellulose polysaccharide is connected by a different type of glycosidic bond. This actually makes all the difference in the world in whether or not the enzymes in our body can break down the polysaccharide or not. The glycosidic bonds in amylose, which is what we eat whenever we eat starch or glycogen, can be broken apart 
by our enzymes. But those glycosidic bonds in cellulose cannot. We can eat all the plants we want, and while we will get nutrition out of them, we will not be able to break apart the cellulose that makes up their cell walls. That'll actually pass through our digestive system undigested and be eliminated from our body with all the other undigested food in our feces. The second group of biological macromolecules we're going to talk about here are the lipids, also known as the fats, oils, and waxes. And these are also made out of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, though one group is also made out of phosphorus. One of the things that makes lipids unique is that there are no lipid polymers. Lipids exist as individual molecules, and that's basically all that they exist as. And even though they're made out of the same elements that carbohydrates are, they're put together in fundamentally different ways. In order to build a lipid, you're going to take a glycerol molecule, which is a short three carbon alcohol, and you're going to stick fatty acids onto that molecule. You can always recognize these fatty acids with, by these long tails of carbons and hydrogens that extend away from the carboxyl or the acid functional group. The fatty acid in the middle of the slide is a saturated fatty acid, and what we mean by that is it's a totally straight chain of carbons and hydrogens. There are only single bonds between the carbons in the chain. The one below that is an unsaturated fatty acid, and what we mean by that is that there's a double bond between two of the carbons in the chain. As a result, the unsaturated fatty acid has this kind of kinked shape. This actually influences the properties of molecules that incorporate fatty acids. Specifically, saturated fatty acids have a higher melting point. They will solidify at a higher temperature because it's easier for molecules that have saturated fatty acid chains to stack together since they're all straight. Unsaturated fatty acids have a lower melting point. You have to lower the temperature more to freeze them than you have to do with fatty acids, and that's because the kinked shape in the unsaturated fatty acid tails makes it more difficult for unsaturated lipids to stack together. This may seem like a fine point of distinction, but it's actually a major strategy that's used in biological systems to prevent the cell from freezing up when the temperature goes down. There are three major types of lipids that you should be familiar with for the purpose of this course. The first is the triglyceride. You get a triglyceride by taking a glycerol molecule and combining it with three fatty acid tails. The example triglyceride that I'm showing you here has the glycerol up at the top, and we can see that it's an unsaturated fatty acid because those fatty acid tails have kinks in them. Triglycerides are used in biological systems for long-term energy storage. They actually store more energy per unit of mass than carbohydrates do. And the other place where you may have some familiarity with triglycerides is their use in insulation. Most of animal fat, for instance, is made out of triglycerides. I've also put a note here that when you make a triglyceride, you liberate three water molecules, one for each place where you join that fatty acid to the glycerol molecule. Again, just making the point that dehydration synthesis is the way in which we build biological molecules. Our second group of lipids is the phospholipids. You get these by joining a glycerol with two fatty acids and replacing the third one with a phosphate group. Phospholipids are the main ingredient in cell membranes. They're what makes the cell membrane bilayer. And the reason they can do this is because the phosphate group is hydrophilic or attracted to water, and the fatty acid tails are hydrophobic or repelled from water. The term for any molecule that has a hydrophilic and a hydrophobic region is an amphipathic molecule. And as a result, when you put phospholipids into water, they will spontaneously form into structures that enable the stable arrangement of these hydrophilic heads and hydrophobic tails. Let's look at how this is done in the cell membrane proper. So what we have here is just a typical cell. We're gonna look at this little corner of the cell membrane. We can't see the phospholipids yet, but we're gonna go in and look at that little square that I've outlined here in blue. We'll blow that up here, and there you can see the individual phospholipids. They're represented here in cartoon form, but notice that the phosphate head is pointing outward into the aqueous environment surrounding the cell or inside of the cell, and the fatty acid tails are pointed inward toward each other. That's what we call the phospholipid bilayer. It's one of the main ingredients in any cell membrane, and it's because of phospholipids' amphipathic nature that this structure, which is incredibly important for living systems, can exist stably. The last group of lipids that you need to be aware of are the steroids, and we can recognize steroids because they have multiple fused rings together. Steroids play a really important role in cell signaling, and we'll talk about that later on in this course. They serve as one important group of hormone molecules, the chemical messages that are sent from one cell to another, and they also serve a role in the cell membrane as a temperature buffer. Let's look at each of these functions in depth. 
Here are two different steroid hormones. Notice the fused rings. These are the hormones estrogen and testosterone, which are really important in determining mammalian secondary sexual characteristics, why males look like males and females look like females. And notice that these two molecules are almost identical. In fact, it may be hard to spot the difference, so I've gone ahead and surrounded it here for you. But that small difference is all that you need in order to send a completely different message to any cell that receives these signals. In terms of the temperature buffer function of steroids, we can see that in the cell membrane. There's a steroid molecule incorporated right there into the bilayer. And the steroids basically act as molecular bumper cars in the cell membrane. If the membrane gets too hot and the phospholipids start moving too much, the cholesterol will get in the way and slow the phospholipids down, which prevents them from moving as fast as they would if the cholesterol wasn't there. Similarly, if things are getting too cold and the membrane starts to solidify, the cholesterol will also get in the way there and prevent the fatty acid tails from being able to form a stable crystal lattice. Since the cholesterol is helping to moderate the effects of the membrane getting both too hot and too cold, we say that it acts as a temperature buffer. So that's it for our discussion of carbohydrates and lipids. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure that you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure that you can describe the structural characteristics of carbohydrates and lipids. You want to definitely be able to recognize them if you see them. Also make sure that you can explain how carbohydrates and lipids contribute to biological systems. And finally, make sure that you can explain how changes or variations in the structure of carbohydrates and lipids contribute to the variations we see in those molecules. How, for instance, do the variations in amylose and cellulose contribute to the differences in whether or not biological systems can use them or what they use them for? How do the differences in saturated and unsaturated fatty acid tails contribute to differences in the melting points and freezing points of those molecules? If you can do those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.